One of the most amazing things that one discovers by investigating this mental landscape of ours is that actually very little is what it seems. So we have an unshakable sense, a really deeply ingrained illusion that we actually experience all of this around us, moving around, flowing completely, veridically as it's coming in. And actually, um, that's not at all what happens when you test the limits and the capacities of human perception with experimental tools. It turns out that at any given moment, we are aware of maybe at most a handful of things, maybe three, four things at a time. Everything else is just filled in as a blur. Uh, and we can choose to select and focus on any one thing at a time and somehow we sew together all these glances and bits that we pick up at every moment into this impression of a whole. At any given time, the brain already has a lot of foreknowledge and predictions about what's going to occur in the world. And it's constantly hypothesis testing, throwing out possibilities against which it checks what's coming in externally. So whereas we tend to think that, you know, from our perceptions we build our memories, it actually turns out that it is also our memories that actually guide our perceptual system. The goals that we keep in mind are also shaping what memory is also shaping to guide perception. And in addition, things like our motivational state, if we're hungry um, or if we are finding shelter, all of these multiple sources of internal signals are acting upon the systems in the brain in order to prepare them to pull out the things that are relevant. Some of these are um, ideas that have very beautiful old roots way back to the 1800s when people were able to think about the problem of perception just in, a, in an intuitive way. So going back to the 1800s, for example, people like uh, Hermann von Helmholtz proposed that you couldn't actually have perception if you didn't have memory to organize perception in the first place. And now we're actually finally, 200 years later, able to start understanding how does that come about. In my own laboratory, we've done a lot of work to contribute to this notion of selective attention, trying to understand the mechanisms through which the brain is able to prioritize information processing. Um, like most of the rest of the attention field, we've done a lot of work in trying to understand how our immediate goals influence the perceptual competition, prioritization, selection and, in and integration. In addition, we actually have played, I would say, a rather pioneering role in sort of bringing these old ideas that I told you about before, about how long-term memories are able to guide perception. So what we do, um, unlike most of the studies and, and, and including some of our previous own studies where we have very simple stimuli uh, which cue people to what relevant events are going to occur, we actually teach people new memories. We give them new spatial, contextual associations for where target events um, happen. So, you know, for example, um, if you're expecting a friend uh, on the beach in Copacabana, you know your friend lives in a certain place, you might expect them to arrive from a certain location. So you might be able to prioritize that location of space, for example, in expecting your friend to arrive. So we've, we give people these kind of contexts in which we teach them these associations. Uh, and then we look at what the brain does when we present the person with that context and they are anticipating a relevant event to happen. So we catch the brain just at that moment of pre-perception, as uh, William James called it, you know, 100 years ago, or this anticipation moment. In my opinion, investigating high-level cognitive functions in the human brain is unbeatable. I mean, there is nothing more exciting than, than doing this, in, in my view. But of course, it also poses formidable challenges. Um, if we're interested in working on these big questions uh, on the human brain, we are limited by 
obviously for very good reasons, with methods that are non-invasive and that are not harmful to our participants. Um, and that means that we don't have the same experimental control and we don't have the same resolution for looking at the circuitry inside the human brain that might be mediating some of these um, functions. So um, we have to sort of live with the limitations of our methodology. Our methods are improving and you know, changing all the time. So when I started doing my PhD, I could never do the things that I do now. And uh, I will never be able to do the things that the future generations will be able to do. And I can only imagine and fantasize what it is or what kinds of tools that you guys may have um, to explore these questions. Okay, shall I start again? 